Much easier. All right. Ready to roll? You want to wait a minute? Okay, perfect. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. First and foremost, thanks for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it. Everyone's sitting towards the front. I was in a couple stable talks earlier, and it was, like, scattered. So I hope there's something going on back there. Believe me, I'm not that interesting. Um, my talk is about NoSQL injections moving beyond uh, 1 equals 1. Um, I'll, I'll go into kind of why I feel this is kind of relevant and important in today, but uh, long story short, I think NoSQL is a pretty informative topic. Uh, we're going to cover a little bit about uh, who I am, what NoSQL does, uh, having fun with Mongo logs, although I'm not going to delve into Mongo too much. you got to be here at 9 a.m. tomorrow to get into that. I will cover that later. <laughs> Um, but we will get into some NoSQL fun. We'll exploit Elasticsearch. Uh, we'll take a look at how RESTful API is the most dangerous thing to ever hit NoSQL, and then we'll see how CouchDB is an admin party by default. Um, so real quick, uh, my name is Matt Bromley. I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, I currently do digital forensics and incident response with KPMG. But uh, my job is not so much forensics as it is more of looking at what happened and trying to see things from the other side. Um, I maintain a blog. Uh, I barely ever have time to update it. I think I go like a month or two between posts, which I suppose is, is normal um, when you're busy. And then I tweet as well. But uh, lately my tweet has been, my Twitter account has been me yelling at uh, um, startup companies who don't give me pr products that they promise me. Don't ever buy a coin if anyone ever saw that thing. It's a waste of time. Or a SkyDrop. It's a horrible product. Anyways, moving on. Yeah, well, it's it's a shame because I, I want to use Coin for all of my like loyalty cards, like because I travel so much, I hate carrying all that stuff around. But anyways, um, so real quick, no sequel here, there, everywhere. Um, RDMS is not the answer or the only answer anymore, I guess we should say. Um, no sequel has been around for a little while, but it's really starting to, I think, grow um, with the web app development culture and startup culture and everything that's just completely blowing up these days. Everyone wants something quick, fast, and easy. Um, no SQL solutions are quick, they scale very, very easily, which is fantastic, and there's fast ingestion with no data structure. Um, you don't need to worry about tables to put them in as long as you have a properly formatted JSON document, you're good to go. I do apologize, too. I've been saying NoSQL. That's, that's a horrible, horrible habit to have, so I'm trying to get out of it. Um, they're also web app friendly. Um, the beauty in that is connecting Mongo to, uh, you know, um, connect, sorry, connecting Mongo to a web app is like three lines of code. It's fast, it's easy, you can get data in, you can get data out. Um, a lot of companies like to use it for web app development because it's just that simple. And there's many solutions as well. Mongo, Couchbase, CouchDB, Elasticsearch. Hadoop's another one. Um, it's a very traditional NoSQL, or sorry, it's, it's not the traditional NoSQL. It doesn't necessarily operate in JSON, but it certainly is an interesting um, alternative. And I don't really need to go into the history of Hadoop. So when I first talked about doing this, a lot of my colleagues said, well, no SQL, who, who cares? No point. Um, so I had the uh, benefit of putting together a list of people using all of these companies and kind of put it in front of them and saying, someone cares. Um, ADP, Cisco, IBM, McAfee, Forbes are, are running stuff on Mongo. This is all public, by the way. None of this is something I know that you don't. These are all very public-sized case studies. BMW, the U.S. Senate, Comcast, Starbucks are using Couchbase, and Elasticsearch, I mean, Netflix and, Netflix and GitHub don't run without it. Um, also Zing, which I believe is a European-based social networking site. In any event, there's a lot of companies in there who have data that I may or may not be interested in, or you may or may not be interested in, or someone somewhere may, na may or may not be interested in. Long story short, it's only a matter of time before I get called to some breach investigation and someone says, oh, the majority of our data sits in Mongo. I don't want to be that guy who looks back at them and says, well, I brought four SQL gu sorry, SQL gurus with me, but uh, we don't have anyone trained in Mongo. So I've taken it upon myself to start to learn about this and, and see, uh, see what's out there. And I started with Mongo. Um, Mongo's an interesting DB. I think it's, it's got some, some pretty neat features in it. Um, it's definitely, I want to say, probably one of the loudest and proudest NoSQLs. They're huge about trainings and, and and uh, going around the country and being very, very, very proud about uh, who uses them and everything. So that being said, um, let's take a look at the, some of the properties of Mongo logging and see how we can use or not use that to our advantage. Uh, first and foremost, Mongo logging defaults to standard out. Wonderful. Thank you, Mongo. Um, if I have terminal access or if I'm running Mongo, I can see everything that happens just from the screen. 
Um, obviously, there's ways to configure Mongo to run as a service. Um, we can get rid of standard out if we want. There's two options Mongo gives by default. Uh, you can use log path. You can use a, specify, a specific file and output to there. Uh, you can also use syslog if you want as well. So there's a couple different ways to A, not log to standard out, and B, get the log somewhere else if you'd like. Um, but it's not very verbose by default. Um, it's, it records a couple of things. We'll go over what it does in just a minute. Um, but you do need to throw some verbose flags in there if you want it to catch everything. Now the problem is you can either have a little bit of Mongo logging or you can have a lot of Mongo logging. Playing around with verbose gets you probably somewhere in the middle ground of where you may want to be, but there's no checkbox, for example, you know, log this, log that. Give, don't give me transactions, but give me deletes, so on and so forth. Um, these logs get big real, real quick. Mongo has a nice little feature where it does millisecond index updates and verifications, and running one, or sorry, a single node, I was able to get a very, very large Mongo file in just a matter of minutes. If you were running a scaled out, multi-node, multi-enterprise, thousands of transactions per minute, I wouldn't even want to think about how big that log file would get. So, if anyone here is on log analysis, as you know, verbose logging is probably not turned on, just because of how big it gets. This is a benefit for us. Um, so, now we can take a look and, and move on to kind of what Mongo does log by default. Um, I didn't go with the verbose option for this just to see what by default it does because I'm a big fan of default installs. They're usually what I run into. I didn't think SA would be as popular of a username as it ever was, but it did a lot of good things for a lot of good people. Um, hopefully none of them are in this room. Um, so first and foremost, connections and disconnections. Uh, Mongo does record who connects to the server. Um, now note, I did all of this via a command line shell. Um, this is not web connections or a specific web app connection or anything of that sort. This is just me getting into the shell. Um, it's going to record an IP. It's going to report the, cor the port you connected over. And it's also going to assign you a number as well. So if you notice the top box there, I'm number one. Anything I do from there on out that's logged is logged as con one. We can have a thousand users connecting if we want, and we're just going to see a complete multitude of, of options going on. Con one, con two, con 950, so on and so forth. So from a logging perspective, or forensic perspective, which is where eventually I get the phone call, is it's very easy to track these connections. I can find who's bad, and then I can quickly run a, a you know, a grep, set, and all, and figure out what it is I need to know about that user. So I can move very quickly through the logs. So that's nice. So far, thank you, Mongo. I like what you've done for me. Uh, now let's look at basic CRUD ops. Number one, creating. Creating's easy. So I just did a sample uh, insert statement here. Um, this is like the default Mongo insert statement as well, which is creating a blog. Apparently everyone creates blogs from the command line. I don't know why they use that as their default, but in any event, <laughs> they do. I, I used to use Jekyll, so I have a little bit of an idea what that's like. Um, in any event, nicely a create statement is recorded. So, okay, we can see data being pushed to the, the MongoDB. I'll take that. That's good. So far, so good. Everything's been logged in a way that I can go and backtrack it, and I can find out, okay, I, someone else logged in. They created data. All right, we're looking good. Let's see if I read data. Um, okay, so we can just run a simple find one command, which is just going to pick a random command from that collection, and there are no log results. And I don't know if I'll be able to actually switch to... No, that's not going to work. Never mind. Um, if anyone would like to see a live post of this, I can do that afterwards. But there's no results in the log. So reading, none. So if you can get into a MongoDB, your connection's logged, but then you can read whatever you want at random. Let's try updating this blog post. I'm going to make a comments array and push that to the post. Again, no log entries. So now, my two out of, two out of the three CRUD operations I've studied so far do not log, do not record. I've logged into a DB, I've read, and I've updated records without looking. This update statement is kind of boring. I put a post, uh, I put a comments array into a blog post. It'd be even better if it was like name, SSN, address, so on and so forth. And I was to just quickly change that to something that was a little bit more favorable to me. And then last but not least, let's delete. Using the title as my key, I can go ahead and delete the blog post. And once again, no log entries. So default Mongo, I can log in. I can read, update, and delete records with no default logging whatsoever. Now, I'm no wizard at, at NoSQL by any means, but if I'm going and investigating my NoSQL instance and all I see is con2 and then an hour later con2 disconnects and I see nothing in between, I don't know why else you'd log into a MongoDB for an hour, but three of the four primary operations are not going to be recorded. So thank you, Mongo. Um, that makes it very interesting for us all.
in kind of tracking what had happened. Um, so what else can we do with Mongo? We can look at data. Can we get any other information? We can grab our databases. We can display our collections. We can also display all the users that are able to log into the machine. Once again, no logging. All right, I'm pretty close to now walking the extent of a MongoDB with very, very little interaction with logs, which from an IR point of view is horrible if you're the guy doing the IR. If you're the one in the MongoDB pulling out data, you're in a really, really good spot. Now note, that's going to be by default. Anyone can go and change that, but default is everyone's favorite option. It's really quick to just app get MongoDB and then go on coding. Um, so Mongo presents an interesting perspective because it's very, very popular, and by default, the logging just downright sucks. Um, there's very, very little that it captures with regard to the information that you can collect. A connection is one thing. Um, documenting that is great. But if I don't know what you did while you were connected, then I have no control. So a malicious connection to a MongoDB immediately becomes the entire DB is compromised because I can't track what you were looking at. So with regards to logging compared to what someone can do, it's astronomical in, in, uh, in size. Now, knowing what we know about Mongo logging, uh, we can now have some fun with NoSQL. Um, and uh, I think there's a couple different options to look at. First, though, is kind of a tease. Oh, sorry. Well, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, there's, there's one thing to remember about all of these NoSQL options, which makes life really, really easy and interesting. They all have default ports, which is really fun. Mongo's 27017. Um, any script you see or download from Mongo is going to have that hard-coded in. It'll ask you to change it if, if you're sitting somewhere else. Elasticsearch, the RESTful API sits on 9200. Java nodes communicate via 9300. And CouchDB listens on 5984. These are by default. So, I mean, unless someone goes in and physically changes that, then you're stuck where you're at. And, you know, 3389 and 1433 have been around for a long time now. So, that being said, um, let's take a look and see what we can do with some of these fun alternatives. Uh, this is where the tease comes in. I'm not going to go over any Mongo. Uh, Russell's going to be talking about it tomorrow morning. I'm not going to steal any of his thunder, but uh, make sure to be there at 9 a.m. I know it's bright and early. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it doesn't mean we can't talk about some others. So, exploiting Elasticsearch. Um, has anyone here used Elasticsearch before? Have any interaction with it? Okay. It's, it's an awesome platform. I use, I use Elasticsearch for a lot of analytics. Uh, I, I've done upwards of free text searches across like 200 million rows in about three milliseconds and that kind of stuff. It's just power you just can't compete with. It's really, really fast. It also happens to be wonderfully vulnerable. Um, the primary vulnerability of Elasticsearch is CVE 2014-3120. Obviously, it came out a little bit earlier this year. Um, Elasticsearch, by default, up until version 1.2, had dynamic scripting in cap uh, enabled. The goal of this was that if you have a massive cluster spread across you know, states, countries, organizations, whatever it may have been, you could issue update commands using dynamic scripting. Um, good intentions, but good intentions always get exploited for the wrong reasons. Um, there's a couple other inherent features of Elasticsearch which uh, make it, you know, which, which I guess handicap it, if you will. Um, from the onset, no access roles or authentication. In fact, to this day, if you want to incorporate security in Elasticsearch, you're downloading a plugin configuring it and installing that. It is not an inherent feature. Uh, there's an HTTP accessible API, and Elasticsearch allows expressions to be evaluated as part of a query. Hopefully this slide alone, like gears are turning in everyone's head, and you can just see how awful that is of a combination. If I, I couldn't sell you that. I don't, hopefully I couldn't, well, never mind, I take that back. I've been to a lot of places. Um, some places you could sell that at, but no one here should want to buy that. So let's take a look at what the exploit, exploit looks like. Um, this is just a sample. Uh, I just took some screenshots and everything. Um, it's, this was actually create, made by the creator, and I've, I've got the link at the bottom there for it. And uh, it's a simple page. Um, all the code is sitting behind it, but it's a simple, you enter your Elasticsearch IP address, drop in whatever file it is you want to read, and click me, and that's it. Um, you also have the opportunity to write a file if you want as well. So we can take a look, a look at this code and see exactly what's going on here. We've got two very, very simple JavaScript functions. Uh, they're simple because, quite frankly, all we're doing is building strings. Um, the first one is to read a file. You can see the Java imports, and then we use new scanner. So all we're doing is reading a file in place. The write file, same imports, and then we use print writer. So this isn't anything extremely advanced. It's just very, very convenient and happens to work. Um, so, going back, uh, I, I read Etsy password because why not? It's there. 
and sure enough, it read it on the first try. So now we've got a severely privileged file being read by an Elasticsearch instance. And there's another benefit here, which I'll go back to my little list there, which comes into play. No access roles or authentication. A large majority of Elasticsearch are run as root because it's just easy to do it that way. So now I am using Java to read or write with root permissions anywhere on the file system. Thank you very much, devs. My life just got a lot easier. Um, so now we can read files. Awesome. That was easy. Via an Elasticsearch instance, I didn't need to break into anything. All I had to do was find the port for Elasticsearch, and the rest just did itself. Now note, Elasticsearch, after version 1.2, disabled dynamic scripting by default, but it's a simple config file change, and you're right back in business. Um, so, you know, though I like to look at this as if you can get in and disable that, and you're able to read and write from Elasticsearch, that changes what the footprint you need to maintain on a server. Just let the web server do the job for you. Easy enough. Now, that's all fun and games. What else can I get from Elasticsearch? There's a lot more information to be gleaned from these things. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. I actually PCAP the traffic for this as well. Um, it's horrible in URI encoding and everything, and it looks just terrible in these colors. Luckily, the TCP stream makes sense. But long story short, when I blow it away, clean it up, and highlight what it is, this is the file that's being passed through. So you can see the search query being passed through, and then our script being added in where we're creating the Java file of reading Etsy password. So we're in a really good spot. Um, works out well. As I just showed you, it, it, it's successful. Um, now this is where I was getting to, which is what else can I get from Elasticsearch? Because not only are we able to read and write files in the system, what can I get with barely touching the system at all? Well, luckily, Elasticsearch gives us a lot of host and node information, as well as system information. Um, so really simple query um, using curl, xget, nodes, and I use pretty equals true so that it's not just a string of JSON, it actually gives you lines and tabs and everything like that. One command, I'm able to get my node name, the IP address I'm running at, what version of Elasticsearch, that would be great if I want to test whether or not I'm going to be vulnerable. I can also take a look at some of my data plugins and paths and see where everything's located. Um, so I can see my HTTP address, my transport address, a lot of information in one screen with one query. Also within the same query, we get the Java version information. I couldn't ask for more gold in an, HT, in an HTML query, or sorry, an HTTP query. Um, we've got Java version, we know what, uh, oops, sorry, Java version, we know who it's made by, uh, we've got some heap information, but long story short, that version is going to be the most important part. If I find you're running a server and your Java is, has a has a version that's very outdated. Any exploit that's out there, you've just been opened up to, and all I had to do was run one query. Um, we can also pull file system information back. So, I mean, you know, Elasticsearch M. Bromley is a giveaway. I'm Matt Bromley giving the talk about Elasticsearch, so I didn't feel bad about putting that detail in there. But path and device could be a lot of information, a lot of very interesting information. If I was unfamiliar with the cluster setup, I could very easily start to map out how your structure, how your cluster, how your disk is put together. Um, and then last but not least, we can also dump OS information. So this is an Intel MacBook Pro, uh, 2600 megahertz. All that just from running one query. I was able to pull all that back. So now I've just profiled your Elasticsearch server, gotten all your node information, everything with just one query. And the best part is, because Elasticsearch was created by guys who like convenience, you can then filter down and just specify what it is you want to see. So the bottom command there is querying. Just give me nodes, OS, file system, and JVM. I don't feel like scrolling. Give me exactly the information that I want. Very, very easy to just profile a server in an instance. Then you can be really, really naughty, and you can shut down a node or the entire cluster from the HTTP. Uh, you can send one curl command and bring the whole thing down. So if you've got very little access uh, ACL on this, and you feel like causing some havoc to someone, and they've got a default ES instance, one command, shut it down. All done. Problem solved. Um, so Elasticsearch, there's a lot of ways to have a lot of fun. Um, it's an awesome product, but I wish, wish they'd wrap a little bit more security around this. Um, let's move on to CouchDB. CouchDB is another interesting one. Anyone here want to join the admin party? CouchDB by default serves out on port 5984. The underscore utils page is by default accessible to anyone who can hit it. And by default, you're an admin. In fact, if you take a look at the bottom corner, they actually, someone coded the phrase, welcome to admin party in CouchDB. Um, so if you have a default install, you're now sitting inside the admin party. What can we do inside the admin party? 
Uh, we could disable SSL certificates if it was in there. We could look up other SSL information. We could also create, delete, modify user accounts. If I'm trying to glean some information from a CouchDB, I'm in the right place now. SSL and user accounts, I mean, I'm pretty happy with where I'm at right now. And then we also have HTTP API calls. Just because why not? It would be more fun this way. Um, so all the information that we saw in the config screen, oops, sorry, some of the information, we can also pull all of this back just by using uh, curl again. So we can dump all of the DBs, we can dump all the config information, and then the log file at the end is actually really interesting. You can dump, you can tail the log file of who's been accessing the server. So, I mean, you know, as long as I have an IP that's running default CouchDB, I can dump your web logs for the past X number of, you know, minutes, seconds, whatever it may be, without even knowing you or who you are or what you've been up to. Um, and I wasn't able to really grab screenshots of those, unfortunately, but what I'm going to see if I can do is that way, way too small to see. We've got a couple minutes, so I was going to take an opportunity to show just how awful some of this is. Is that any better? All right, cool. All right, so let's see if we can't just... All right, perfect. That looks like a very, very useful piece of information. Um, obviously, it's all going to show local hosts and everything. But if I was interested in, in who's been who's been calling the database, who's been pulling information back, this would be a great command to have. Because um, now I don't need to know who has access. I can use IPs to figure out who's pulling what. So if I've discovered a default CouchDB, I've also just now found who your customers are. Because I now know who's pulling your information. And then if we take a look at the config, this is not going to be as pretty as Elasticsearch is because it just dumps out in straight JSON. But... Um, I'll take config information. This can be pretty useful stuff if I wanted to craft an exploit or find something else to do with your server. Um, so there's a lot of information in here. Uh, and, you know, we can get down to HTTP addresses, um, you know, default admin information, so on and so forth. So it, it can be very, very fun to uh, find exploits or find default installations. Um, that's going to take me to the end. I think I've got a couple minutes to spare. I didn't want to run over because uh, I know everyone's probably got other better things to do than watch this. Anyways, my name is Matt. Uh, there's some contact information up there if anyone has any questions. There's the obligatory red, my opinions are my own. If anyone from my employer was here, they'd kill me if I didn't have that. And last but not least, just to make sure he's awake and active, go see Russell's talk at 9 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> With that, thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> and then if there's any questions, I mean, of course, but yeah. Sorry? Uh, yeah, that, that could be one way to get around it. I've seen multiple methods. I, I guess segregation is, a, is another way. Like, I've seen multiple stops along the way. Um, but it would be nice if there was inherent security as well. Um, but yes. Um, I've seen that. I've seen it put behind. Um, you know, like web servers and that kind of stuff. It could be that. Um, it just depends on what, it, A, it depends on what you have in there. Um, like, you know, I listed some companies earlier. S some companies use it to, for metadata. I think eBay uses Mongo for metadata or something. It's not as valuable as PayPal information, so the access controls are going to be a little bit different. But from a mitigation point, I've seen firewalls on there. Um, that can get tough because when you're running web apps, you want to be able to, like, what you have in front, it needs to be perfect every single time or you're going to lose everything. Uh, I've seen web servers, so people who use uh, custom GUIs or you know HTML pages and that kind of stuff, they'll have an authentication server, so you authenticate in Apache, for example, and then it's unfettered access from there and everything. So it depends on how the organization puts it together. And then, like I said, Elasticsearch, for example, does have security plugins. You can tie that in with NTLM, Kerberos, so on and so forth, and you can limit Elasticsearch document access to usernames and everything. It's just no one does it. Sure, no problem. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>